According to a survey by UNICEF, in 2022, out of all of the youth of upper secondary school or around high school age, 27% were not enrolled in any education with the percentage jumping to 45% for least developed countries. Furthermore, the completion rate of upper secondary school is a mere 45% for the world and an astonishing 22% for the least developed countries. The majority of the human population doesn't have the opportunity to even think about higher education. How many Einsteins, Shakespeare's, Bach's, and Euler's has humanity missed out on because of this? We may never know. At least in the modern era, it's become easier for those of the developed world to hone their skills and, if their talents or passion necessitate, contribute to the advancement of humanity. But throughout history, many regions and long eras have gone by where a thousand Newtons may have been born, but none ever reached that point to do so. Of course, there were golden ages for mathematics and sciences in ancient Greece, India, Arabia, China, and most recently, the scientific revolution brought much higher level of science and mathematics to Europe. In the case of mathematicians from around the 15th century onward, great minds have changed the field in incredible ways, such as Descartes, Fermat, Newton, Euler, Gauss, Abel, Galois, Riemann, Lee, Cantor, Hilbert, Hardy, Ramanujan, Gödel, and the list goes on and on. If only one of these men decided to pursue something other than mathematics, or if they were born in the wrong place and time, would mathematics be less than what it is? If Newton or Leibniz were never born, how long would it have taken for a calculus to be discovered and developed? How many theorems would have waited years or decades if Euler became a pastor, as was his father's wishes? We are all fortunate that these great minds lived the way they did, but history is full of fortunates as much as unfortunates. J.H. Hardy declared in his A Mathematician's Apology that mathematics, more than any other arts or science, is a young man's game. Of course, this isn't always true. Paul Erdős is a prime example of a busy mathematician well into his age. Benoit Mandelbrot discovered the famous Mandelbrot set in his 50s, and Karl Weierstrauss got his doctorate in mathematics at 37. But there is still some truth to it. The Fields Medal is regarded as the greatest prize in mathematics, comparable to the Nobel Prize, yet the Fields Medal really is supposed to be for young mathematicians under the age of 40. We see prodigies and young geniuses pop up all the time. I mean, the greatest mathematician arguably of this generation is Terence Tao, and he's a prime example of that. Even if youth is powerful to mathematics, there are mathematicians who died too soon in their youth, making incredible strides in the field in only a few decades. Geniuses interrupted by the unfortunate and chaotic nature of life, leaving us to wonder what more could have been. Perhaps the greatest example of this is Everest Galois. His mathematical work and discoveries directly contributed to the development of abstract algebra and Galois theory, connecting what are called fields and groups. Galois theory re related polynomial equations to groups called Galois groups, and these groups can then determine the solvability by radicals of the corresponding polynomials. What are these Galois groups? Well, you would need a decent amount of abstract algebra knowledge, which I assume the majority of you don't have. I mean, if you watched my previous video on vector spaces, I did explain some very basic concepts of abstract algebra, including the definition of fields and groups. If you don't know what these are, in essence, they're sets with certain operations that follow certain rules, called axioms. For now, all you need to know is that the rationals, reals, complex numbers, along with the usual addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division that we are familiar with, each compose what we call a field. Now, a field can be extended, and these are called field extensions. Essentially, if all the elements of one field are a subset of another, then we say that the latter is an extension field of the former. For example, the reals are obviously a subset of the complex numbers, meaning that every real number is also a complex number. Since they're both fields, the field of complex numbers is an extension field of the field of real numbers. And we denote it like this. 
Now, we can define functions between fields, formerly called homomorphisms, meaning that we can map elements of one element to another. In the case of a field of real numbers, these functions are just the usual real-valued functions we're familiar with, like x squared or sine of x. Now, there are special types of functions. One is called an isomorphism, which is pretty much just a bijection. So every element of one field is assigned to exactly one element of another, and no element is left without an assignment. Another is called an automorphism, which is an isomorphic function from one field to itself. Now, if we have k as an extension field of f, meaning f is a subset of k, then an f automorphism of k is an isomorphism, sigma, from k to k that is the identity morphism for f. So, sigma of c is equal to c for all c and f. Now, it's okay if you're a bit lost. I'm going through a lot of abstract algebra stuff very quickly. But we can apply this to the reals and complex numbers to get a more familiar example. As I said, the complex numbers are a field extension of the reals, so can we find an R automorphism of C? Yes. Think of the complex conjugate, which takes a complex number and gives us complex conjugate. This turns out to be an automorphism in C, and the rough idea is that the complex conjugate is closed under complex numbers, meaning we won't get a number that's not complex when we take the conjugate, and it's bijective since every complex number has one unique complex conjugate. Now, this complex conjugate map is an R automorphism of C, since for any real number, its complex conjugate is itself. Now, why is all this stuff about automorphisms and whatnot relevant? Well, the set of all F automorphisms of K is a group called the Galois group of K over F. For example, the complex conjugate map is an element of what's called the Galois group of C over R. Now, this is just the beginning of Galois theory, but in essence, he used this idea of Galois groups to solve the centuries-old problem of finding formulas for polynomials of degree 5 and higher, proving that such a task is actually impossible. And this is only one of the numerous contributions that Galois made to mathematics. But what was life like for the young talent? Well, he was born in France in October of 1811 and studied at home until the age of 11, when he entered secondary school. He took a serious interest in mathematics at 14, and in June of 1828, at the age of 16, he attempted the entrance examination for École Polytechnique, the most prestigious mathematics institution in France at the time. He promptly failed, but he tried again the next year only a couple days later after his father's suicide in 1829 and was rejected again. He entered a different school called the Coli Preparatoire in October but was expelled a year later because of his behavior regarding some political disagreements. In July of 1831, he was arrested and spent eight months in prison, and only a month after his release, he was challenged to a duel which he died on May 31st, 1832 at the age of 20. The night before the duel, Galois wrote down his final mathematical ideas, and in these notes he also wrote une femme, or a woman, who was most likely the cause at the center of the duel. He spent about six years in mathematics only to be cut short, yet he contributed more to mathematics in those six years than most would hope to in their entire life. If he lived for even just five more years, what other things could he have discovered? Some mathematicians are discovered, meaning that they had remarkable talent, but were unknown to the majority of the mathematical world until someone found him. The greatest example of this is Srinivasa Ramanujan. He was born in India in 1887, and while India has its fair share of mathematical history, the highest level of mathematics had been developed almost exclusively in Europe since the 14th century. Yet, the self-taught genius rivaled the greatest mathematicians in Europe at the time. Ramanujan's contributions to mathematics are too vast to explain in a short excerpt, but he made incredible strides in analysis and number theory, and in a variety of topics like infinite series, continued fractions, and elliptic functions. One example of Ramanujan's work deals with what's called the partition function. 
take a positive integer n and count how many different ways we can partition n, that is, represent n as a sum of positive integers. For example, if n equals 3, then we have 3, 1 plus 2, and 1 plus 1 plus 1. The partition function, p of n, thus gives us the number of ways that we can partition a number. So p of 3 is 3. The larger our n gets, the more possible partition. So p of 100 is very large at 190,569,292. By convention, p of 0 is equal to 1, since there's only one way to represent 0 as a sum of positive integers, which is just the empty sum, or the sum of nothing. Now, we can define something called the generating function for p of n. What's a generating function? Well, take an infinite sequence, any infinite sequence. Let's label a0, a1, a2, and so on. Then the generating function for this infinite sequence is simply a function f of x equals a0 plus a1 times x plus a2 times x squared, and so on, to infinity giving us an infinite polynomial. Now, since p of n takes non-negative integer values, we can represent the values of p of n as a sequence, namely p0, p1, p2, and so on. So the generating function for p of n is a sum from n of 0 to infinity for p of n x to the n. Now it's important to note that the generating function p of n is not p of n itself, it's just a method of displaying the values for the sequence p of n generates. However, we can also find other ways of describing a generating function. For example, the generating function for p of n can also be represented as an infinite product of 1 over 1 minus x to the n for n from 0 to infinity. Now, Ramanujan, along with a mathematician called Leonard Rogers, discovered what is called the Rogers-Ramanujan identities, shown here, and we can then use this generating function to prove some interesting properties about p of n. Ramanujan also discovered many divisibility properties regarding p of n. Like that 5 always divides p of 5n plus 4, and 7 always divides p of 7n plus 6. And this is just one small area of the incredible and vast mathematical work that he did. But his path to mathematical influence was not easy. His mathematical ability was recognized in India at an early age, eventually earning him a scholarship to the government college in Kubakonam in 1904. He promptly lost that scholarship due to his neglect of most subjects over mathematics. And by 1914, only a few mathematical circles in India knew of Ramanujan's brilliance. And he worked as a clerk in the Madras Port Trust. With encouragement from his friends, Ramanujan wrote to mathematicians in England, hoping to be recognized, but his lack of educational background resulted in very little interest. But then, none other than the number theorist G. H. Hardy saw Ramanujan's talent and arranged for him to travel to England. From 1914 to 1918, G.H. Hardy collaborated with Ramanujan, giving him the platform to make his contribution to mathematics. Unfortunately, Ramanujan became ill with tuberculosis in 1919 and eventually died in 1920 at the age of 32. He spent only four years in Europe, and yet he created unthinkable theorems and ideas across many fields. You can only imagine what more he could have achieved with just a bit more time. Not all stories are as inspirational and extraordinary as Ramanujan's. Some brilliant minds ended not because of the hand of nature, but what feels like injustice. Many of you might have heard of Fermat's last theorem, which up until 1994 was an unsolved conjecture for more than three and a half centuries. It states that the equation a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n has no positive integer solutions for any integer n is greater than two. It was proved by Andrew Wilds using a special case of a then unsolved conjecture. This conjecture, now called the modularity theorem, was then called the Taniyama Shimura conjecture, conjectured by Japanese mathematicians Yukata Tamiyama and Goro Shimura. The Taniyama Shimura conjecture provided a connection between elliptic curves and modular forms. Elliptic curves are a special type of algebraic curves. Algebraic curves over some field F are equations in the form f of x, y equals 0, where f of x, y is a polynomial with coefficients in f. A cubic curve is an algebraic curve in which each term of f of x, y has a maximum of 3 degrees, 
and elliptic curves are a special type of cubic curves. Modular forms can be described with what's called lattices of complex numbers. These are all the complex numbers a plus bi such that a and b are integers, denoted z plus zi. Furthermore, we can generate new lattices using two complex numbers, v and w, to get some lattice lambda equals z v plus z w, which contains complex numbers of the form a v plus b w for integers a and b. Then we can define some function f that takes the set of lattices in c and gives some complex number that satisfies the equation f of alpha lambda equals alpha to the negative k times f of lambda, where alpha is a complex number and k is an integer. If such a function f satisfies a few other conditions regarding differentiability and boundedness, then it's called a modular form of weight k. This is a very surface level explanation, but it turns out that modular forms appear frequently in many aspects of mathematics. In fact, Ramanujan's work on the partition function p of n actually involved modular forms. Now, Taniyama and Shimura conjectured that there was a special connection between elliptic curves and modular forms. In the case of Fermat's last theorem, a mathematician named Gerhard Frey showed that if Fermat's last theorem was false, such that there exists some solution a to the p plus b to the p equals c to the p for positive integers a, b, c, and p greater than 2, then such a solution could be rewritten as an elliptic curve. Fry then conjectured that such an elliptic curve would violate the connection conjectured by Taniyama Shimura that every elliptic curve is modular. The mathematician Ken Ribbit proved that indeed Fry's elliptic equation was not modular. So if Taniyama Shimura was indeed true that every elliptic curve was modular, then Fry's elliptic equation could not exist, meaning that a solution to a to the p plus b to the p equals c to the p does not exist, thus proving Fermat's last theorem. Indeed, the theorem conjectured by these two Japanese mathematicians was now connected with one of the most important unsolved conjectures of all time. But the road to this accomplishment was not so full of glamour. Taniyama was born in 1927 in Japan and Shimura in 1930. They ran into each other in 1954 while looking for the same book in the library. Even well into the 20th century, Asia was quite closed off from the Western developments in mathematics, but this actually worked in favor for the duo as they dug into topics unfashionable in Western mathematics at the time, including modular forms. In 1955, through an international symposium in Tokyo, Taniyama saw a deep connection between modular forms and elliptic curves. While not many took note, his friend Shimura supported his findings, leading to the Taniyama Shimura conjecture. The duo continued to study this connection and refine and develop their conjecture, and by 1957, Taniyama's genius was recognized in America, where he was offered a position at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. Yet, this visit never happened because on November 17th, 1958, at just the age of 31, Taniyama committed suicide. Taniyama left a suicide note citing tiredness both physically and mentally and a loss of confidence in its future. According to Shimura, Taniyama did suffer from depression and regarding the suicide, he stated that nobody was able to give him any support when he desperately needed it. Reflecting on this, I am overwhelmed by the bitterest grief. Taniyama never lived to see the staggering impact his ideas and conjecture had, including its importance in Fermat's last theorem, nor the proof of the full conjecture in 2001. His compatriot, Shimura, who died in May 2019 at the age of 89, did see the fruits of his and his friend's mathematical work. But it's a reality that even the greatest minds are still humans, not machines, and thus mental support is as necessary as physical support. But perhaps the greatest injustice in not only mathematical but all of scientific history has to come from Alan Turing. Turing was born in England in June of 1912. He began his undergraduate studies at King's College, Cambridge in 1931 and became a fellow in 1935. From then, Turing began to study the designability of problems along with his doctoral advisor Alonzo Church. Just four years prior, Kurt Gödel published his paper on Gödel's first incompleteness theorem. 
and thus the fields of mathematical logic and metamathematics were going through a revolution. In this time, Turing described a theoretical machine called the Turing machine, a formalization of the notion of an algorithm. This machine has a finite set of configurations which determine the state that the machine is in. Additionally, it can be supplied with an input of an infinite one-dimensional tape divided into squares containing special symbols. The empty symbol will just denote zero and at least one other symbol. We can have as many symbols as we'd like as long as it's finite, but for our purposes, we can just use zero and one. And it turns out that any Turing machine can be reduced to this sort of binary Turing machine. Now, when Turing machines are fed with this infinite tape of zeros and ones, it reads from some starting square on the tape. Additionally, at any moment, the Turing machine has one of the given states activated. The program of the Turing machine then looks at the current state, the current input on the tape, and it, depending on the state and the symbol, does three things. Write, move, and change state. First, the Turing machine writes a symbol on the current square of the tape. Then it can move the tape one square to the left, or right, or not move at all. And finally, the next state of the machine is chosen. Now, we have a given starting state for the machine, and also a special halt state, which promptly ends the mechanism. We can, in a sense, export the code of this program into its own sequence of zeros and ones called the description number, meaning that if we want, we can feed a Turing machine its own program as the input. One example of a Turing machine is what's called a two-state busy beaver machine. The program of the Turing machine can be written in this state table where we have two possible states denoted A and B plus the halt state, the two symbols 0, 1 for our tape, and A as our initial state. The goal of a busy beaver machine is to input a sequence of just zeros and get as many ones as possible while still halting. So let's test out this busy beaver machine. We have a strip of only zeros and running the program. We get four ones. In general, any two state busy beaver machine will halt after writing exactly four ones. Now, this may seem simple, but theoretically, because of the essentially limitless possibilities of states and inputs and infinite memory, one can build a Turing machine that can do pretty much anything a modern supercomputer can do. Of course, actually describing such a Turing machine will be practically impossible. But Alan Turing used these machines to mathematically and concretely describe any possible algorithm or process. There's one important question. When does a Turing machine, given an input, halt? It's possible that the program is put in a loop, unable to reach a state that allows it to halt. Finding an algorithm to see if a Turing machine loops or halt is called the halting problem. If we can indeed solve the halting problem, then there should exist some computable function h, which given a Turing machine t and an input i, tells us if t with the input i halts or not. Now, if such a function h existed, then that means that there exists a Turing machine capable of computing this function h. Let's call this Turing machine p. And now assuming that p can be constructed, we can then define a new machine, let's call q, which takes in any Turing machine, t, and its description number, we'll call d sub t. Again, this is the sequence of symbols that essentially defines what a Turing machine does. Then, q does the following. If t halts on its own description number, which we again assumed via p that it's computable, then q loops, meaning that it does not halt. If t does not halt on its own description number, then q halts. Now, we can take the machine q and its description number d sub q and then input it back into q. So now q is computing if q itself halts or does not halt on its own description number. Let's say that q does halt on itself. Then, by the definition of q, q outputs loop, meaning that q does not halt on itself, and if q does not halt, then again by the definition of q, q outputs halt, meaning q halts on itself. We have a contradiction. The only option is that q cannot exist, and by extension, since we derived q via the existence of p, p cannot exist. So there does not exist a computable algorithm 
that can tell us if any Turing machine halts or does not halt. The halting problem is undecidable, meaning no algorithm exists that will always correctly solve the problem. Using these Turing machines, Turing was able to build upon Gödel's work and prove that first-order logic was undecidable. His ideas not only drastically changed the landscape of mathematical logic, but it started the field of computability theory. But Turing's theoretical work would quickly necessitate an application. In 1940, the UK declared war on Germany, and Turing was soon brought into the British cipher school to break German coded messages. Turing applied his ideas to build the earliest computers and break the German's Enigma code, giving the Allies an incredible upper hand. Some estimate that Alan Turing and the cipher school's work shortened the war by two years and saved around 14 million lives. But due to the secret nature of the project, Turing's name would not be known for some time. Unfortunately, in 1952, Turing was arrested for violating British law on homosexuality, which resulted in hormonal treatment. On June 7, 1954, Alan Turing died due to cyanide poisoning, most likely ingested through an apple dipped in cyanide solution found in Turing's house. An inquest determined that the death was suicide. He was 41. Stories like these seem unjust. Geniuses and brilliant minds with so much to offer to humanity and so much they have already offered only to die of a gunshot or sickness or suicide. We can sit here and imagine what mathematics could have looked like if their lives were extended, but what's more important is recognizing what they did achieve. These men were so young and yet gave their short lives for a cause and a legacy greater than themselves. Without knowing it, they changed the path of humanity forever, developing theories that will live on far longer than they themselves could ever have. And they had to do so with the odds against them, whether it be political turmoil, lack of access to mathematics, depression, societal persecution, there were many challenges that could have stopped them from achieving greatness. The thing is, even to this day, there are people that are stopped by these challenges. I mentioned at the beginning of the video that the majority of the world is unable to go to higher education. Not to mention other troubles for people from every walk of life, from mental health to sickness to imposter syndrome. Not all of us will leave a legacy to be as brilliant as these mathematicians, but it doesn't mean we can't have an impact. Not only can we be the best that we could be, but also help others, encourage them to reach their best. G.H. Hardy said that the discovery of Ramanujan was his greatest contribution to mathematics. The four short years that Ramanujan spent in England was, in his opinion, greater than the 70 years of his life devoted to mathematics. Leading others to greatness is as great of a legacy as writing your own name in history. Until next time.